Historical Materialism, A System of Sociology by Nikolai Bukharin, Chapter 6, The Equilibrium Between the Elements of Society. A. Connection Between the Various Social Phenomena, Formulation of the Question. In our discussion of the equilibrium between society and nature, we found that this equilibrium is being constantly disturbed and constantly reestablished, that there is there that there it is subject to contradictions which are constantly overcome and then set up anew and then again overcome and that this constitutes the fundamental course of social evolution or social decline we must therefore give some attention to this internal life of society in discussions as to the relative standard of social evolution, we often hear such judgments as the degree of social evolution is determined by the quantity of soap used. Others measure the stage of this advance by the extent of the ability to read and write. Still others by the number of newspapers, a fourth group by the state of technical progress, a fifth group by the stage of, de of development of the sciences, etc. A German professor uh, has advanced the proposition that the stage of civilization is best indicated by the manner of constructing toilet conveniences. We find that beginning with the latter and rising to the most sublime products of the human mind, everything has been used as a standard by which to measure the stage of social develop development. Um, where is the truth? Whose yardstick is the true yardstick? Why have there been so many different answers to this single question? A consideration of all the above answers will show that each of them is more or less correct. Does not the use of soap increase with the growth of culture and civilization? It does. So does the number of newspapers or the social technology or science. At any given time, the social phenomena of the period are always related with each other. Just what this relation is, is another question, which we shall discuss very soon. But that there is such a relation, no one can doubt. That is why all of the above answers are right. Just as the age of a man may be approximately determined on the basis of the structure and hardness of his bones, or on the appearance of his face, his color, wrinkles, growth of hair, etc., or his mode of thought, or his mode of linguistic expression, so we may also judge the stage of growth of society on the basis of a number of indications. For all these indications are connected with other indications and with still others, etc. If we stand face to face with beautiful products of art or complicated systems of science, we rightly declare that these things could not be produced except in a highly developed society. We should make the same remark in the presence of a rich and complicated technology, and our remark would be just as correct. The fact that the most varied social phenomena are connected, are mutually conditioned, is almost self-evident. A series of simple questions will convince the reader immediately. Was futurist poetry possible, for example, a century ago? No, it was not. Could Eskimos living on the ice have invented wireless tel te telegraphy? Is it possible for present-day science to predict man's fate from the stars? Could Marxism have originated in the Middle Ages? It is obvious that all these things are impossible. Futurism could not have appeared 100 years ago because life was then calmer and quieter. Futurism grew up in pavemented cities with their noise and racket, their nervous exhaustion, and the militaristic turmoil of a dissolving bourgeois civilization. This poetry of the brazen Blair could no more have grown up 100 years ago than ivy could grow on a recently tarred roof. Eskimos living on the ice could not have invented the wireless telegraph, for they cannot even handle an ordinary telegraph instrument. Present-day science does not occupy itself with such idiosyncrasies as reading the stars, because science at its present level despises these things. Marxism could not have begun in the Middle Ages because the proletariat was not yet in existence, and therefore there was no soil in which the Marxist theory could grow. Now we have a highly developed technology, a proletariat, a great number of newspapers, advertising on a tremendous scale, 
trusts, futurism, airplanes, the electron theory, Mr. Rockefeller's dividends, strikes of coal miners, the Communist Party, the League of Nations, the Third International, electrification projects, armies consisting of millions, Lloyd George, Lenin, etc. And all these and all these things are manifestations of the same period, the same epoch, just as we may also regard as manifestations of another epoch, the Middle Ages, all of the following. The power of the popes at Rome, a comparatively low level of technology, compulsory labor of peasant serfs, science in the hands of priests, scholastic philosophy, the search for the philosopher's stone, which would turn base metals into gold, etc., the Inquisition, poor roads, illiteracy even among kings, village commons, witches, trade guilds, dog Latin, spoken and written by scholars, robber knights, etc., Lenin, Lloyd George, Krupp, these have no place in the Middle Ages. And on the other hand, we do not expect to find on the Red Square in Moscow a medieval tournament with knights doing each other to death for the favor of a lady's smile. Other times, other songbirds, other songbirds, other songs. There is no doubt of the general connection between social phenomena, of the adaptation of certain social phenomena to others, in other words, of the existence of a certain equilibrium within society between its elements, its component parts, between the various forms of social phenomena. Auguste Comte already stated that the various phases of social life are always adapted to each other at any period. The so-called consensus. Muller Lyer states this even more clearly. Any sociological function, any cultural phenomenon, for instance, art, science, manners, economy, state organization, freedom of the individual, philosophy, the social position of woman, etc., down to the use of soap and the like, may be taken as the measure of the cultural level, and if all the cultural phenomena should develop parallel to each other and at the same right, it would not matter which of these criteria should be applied. One of the latest writers of the hard-pressed German bourgeoisie, Oswald Spengler, writes, How many people know that there is a profound relation in form between the differential calculus and the dynastic state principle of the epoch of Louis the Fourteenth? Between the ancient state form of the polis in Greece and you. Euclidean geometry between the perspective drawing of Western painting and the conquest of space of ra by railroads, telephones, and long-range guns, between contra contrapuntal instrumentation in music and the economic credit system. Spengler's formulation may be disputed, but there is no doubt of the correctness of his thought that the most varied social phenomena are interrelated. B. Things, persons, ideas. We defined society above as an aggregation of persons. In the broader sense, however, society also includes things. Present day society, for instance, with its vast stone cities, its giant structures, its railroads, harbors, machines, houses, etc., all these things are material, technical organs of society. Any specific machine will at once lose its significance as a machine outside of human society. It becomes merely a portion of external nature, a combination of pieces of steel, wood, etc. When a great liner sinks to the bottom, this living monster with its powerful engines that cause the whole marvelous structure of steel to vibrate, with its thousands of appliances of every possible kind, from dish rags to wireless station, now lies at the bottom of the sea and the whole mechanism loses its social significance. Barnacles will attach themselves to its body, its wood constructions will rot in the water, crabs and other animals will live in the cabin. But the steamer ceases to be a steamer, having lost its social existence. It is excluded from society, has ceased to be a portion of society. to perform its social service and is now merely an object, no longer a social object, like any other part of external nature which does not come in direct contact with human society. Technical devices are not merely pieces of external nature. 
they are extensions of society's organs. We may therefore take a broader view of society than we have thus far done. We may make it include also things, i.e. society's technical apparatus, its system of working devices. Strictly speaking, not all things are included among the means of production. Some may even have a very remote relation with this production, aside from the fact that they themselves constitute products of, products of material production. For example, books, maps, diagrams, museums, picture galleries, libraries, astronomical observatories, meteorological stations. We always speak of their physical equipment, lab laboratories, measuring instruments, telescopes and microscopes of every kind, test tubes, retorts, etc. All these things are not directly connected with the process of material production and consequently are not a part of social technology, may not be considered among the material productive forces. Nevertheless, everyone knows their function. They are not merely sections of external nature. They also have their social existence. They also must be included under our concept of society in its broader application. We have seen in chapter four that society constitutes a system of persons considered together. Now we see that things must also be so considered. But in the narrower sense of the word, we understand by society not merely the aggregate of persons involved, but the connected system. We first regarded these persons as material bodies at work. Society, therefore, as we have explained, is above all a working organization, a human working apparatus. But we know very well that human beings are not merely physical bodies. They think, feel, wish, pursue goals, and are constantly changing in their thoughts and desires. The relation between persons are not only material working relations, but also psychical relations, mental relations. Society produces not only material objects, it also produces the so-called cultural values, art, science, etc. In other words, it produces ideas in addition to things. These ideas, once they have been produced, may be developed into large systems of ideas. The trinity of elements in society therefore includes things, persons, ideas. We must by no means assume that these are independent elements. It is, of course, clear that if there were no people, there would be no ideas, that ideas exist only in people and do not swim about in space like oil on the surface of water. But this does not prevent us from distinguishing these three elements. It is likewise clear that there must be a certain equilibrium between the three elements. Roughly speaking, society could not exist unless the system of things, the system of persons, and the system of ideas were adapted each to the other. We shall have to go into this more in detail. We shall then understand the relation between phenomena that is so manifest on the surface and concerning which we spoke in the preceding paragraph. C. Social Technology and the Economic Structure of Society we have already pointed out that in a consideration of social phenomena, it is necessary to begin with the social material productive forces. With the social technology, the system of tools of labor. We may now supplement these remarks. In speaking of the social technology, we of course meant not a certain tool or the aggregate of different tools, but the whole system of these tools in society. We must imagine that in a given society in various places, but in a certain order, there are distributed looms and motors, instruments and apparatus, simple and complicated tools. In some places they are crowded close together, for instance in the great industrial centers. In other places, other tools are scattered. But at any given moment, if people are connected by a labor relation, if we have a society, all these instruments of production, tools and machines, large and small, simple and complicated, manual or power driven, are united into a single system. Of course, a certain type of tool is always predominant. At the present time, this is the type of machines and mechanisms, while formerly it was that of hand tools. The significance of apparatus and self-acting machinery is increasing more and more. In other words, we may consider the social, social technology as a whole, in which each of the parts at a given moment is socially necessary, inevitable. Why may it be so considered? 
Wherein lies the unity of all the parts of the technical system of society? In order to grasp this matter fully, let us suppose that on a certain day, let us say in modern Germany, all the machines serving the purposes of coal mining should miraculously ascend to heaven, the result would be a cessation of practically the entire industrial life. It would be impossible to obtain fuel for factories and shops. All the machines and instruments in these factories would stop working, i.e. would be eliminated from the process of production. The technology of one branch would thus influence practically all the other branches. As a matter of fact, the various branches of production constitute a whole, not only in our thoughts, but objectively in reality. They make up a single social technology. The social technology, we reiterate, is not therefore a mere aggregate of the various instruments of labor, but is their connecting system. On any individual part of this system depends all the rest of the system. At any given moment, also, the various parts of this technology are related in a certain proportion, a certain quantitative relation. If, in a certain factory, we must have a certain number of spindles and a certain number of workers to provide material for a certain number of looms, the more or less normal progress of social production throughout society will also involve the presence of a certain definite relation between the number of blast furnaces and the number of machines and mechanical tools in metallurgy, as well as in the textile industry, the chemical industry, or any other industry. To be sure, this relation may not be precisely fixed as in a single factory, but between the technological systems of the various branches of production, there does exist a certain necessary relation, which may in unorganized society be the, the result of a blind natural process, while in organized society it is the result of a conscious process, but it exists in all society. It is inconceivable, for instance, that a factory should have 10 times as many spindles as it needs. It is likewise inconceivable that 10 times as much coal should be mined as is needed, and that the machines and appliances used in mining coal should be 10 times as numerous as is required in order to supply the other branches of production. Thus, as there is a definite relation and a definite proportion between the various branches of production, there is also in social technology a certain definite relation between its parts, as well as a definite prevailing proportion. This circumstance changes the mere aggregate of tools, machines, instruments, etc. into a system of social technology. This being the case, it is also clear that each given system of social technology also determines the system of labor relations between persons. Is it conceivable, for instance, that the technological system of society, the structure of its tools, should be along certain lines, while the, cre while the structure of human relations should be along entirely different lines? More concretely, is it possible that the technological system of society should be based on machines, while the productive relation, the actual labor relation, should be based on petty industry working with hand tools? Of course, this is an impossibility. Wherever a society exists, there must be a certain equilibrium between its technology and its economy, i.e. between the totality of its instruments of labor and its working organization, between its material productive devices and its material human labor system. Let us explain by means of an example, namely by means of a comparison between so-called ancient society and present-day capitalist society. Let us begin with technology. Albert Neuberger, who is inclined more to exaggerate than belittle the accomplishments of ancient technology, says, Aristotle, in his Problems of Mechanics, enumerates for us the auxiliary, auxiliary mechanical devices made use of in ancient times. They include only the following, the draw well, lever with counterweight, the equal armed balance, the unequal armed or Roman balance, steelyard, the tongs, the wedge, the axe, the windlass, the cylindrical roller, the wagon wheel, the shaft, the pulley, the sling, the rudder, the potter's wheel, as well as revolving wheels of copper or iron with different directions of revolution, which very probably are equivalent to our toothed wheels, gear wheels. These are the most rudimentary technical appliances, otherwise known as simple machines lever, inclined planes, tongs, rollers. 
it is obvious that not much advance was possible with such devices, which were used chiefly in the working of metals. It is clear that only the metallic skeleton of the productive forces constitutes the first permanent basis for their development. Yet, of the metals worked, gold was the most important. The greater quantity of metal was used for the manufacture of objects intended for non-productive consumption. The sole exception is blacksmith work, by means of which rather primitive tools were produced with the aid of hammer, anvil, tongs, file, vice, and other comparatively simple instruments, producing principally axes, hammers, hoes, horseshoes, nails, chains, pitchforks, shovels, spoons, etc. The casting of metals stood chiefly in the service of turning out statues and other non-productive objects. It is therefore not surprising to learn that Vitruvius defines a machine as a device made of wood. For whole centuries, technology stood still, says Salvioli. Of course, not meaning an absolute stagnation, but an extremely slow development of ancient technology. These technical devices naturally also determine the type of worker, the degree of his skill, and also the working relations, the productive conditions. There could only be one type of worker under such a technology, a hand worker, a petty artisan. Blacksmiths, carpenters, masons, weavers, goldsmiths, miners, wagon builders, saddlers, harness makers, lathe workers, silversmiths, potters, dyers, tanners, glassmakers, locksmiths, etc., etc., such are the types of productive workers. Thus, the social technology conditioned the character of the living, working machine, i.e. the type of worker, his labor, skill. But this technology also conditioned the relation between the persons at work. As a matter of fact, because we see here enumerated a number of types of workers, it is plain that we are dealing with a division of production into a number of branches, each one of which produces only a single type of worker. This is called the division of labor. The cause of this division of labor was the existence of corresponding labor tools, but this division of labor was of a peculiar kind. The division of labor could not here lead to the results which it has had in modern societies, for in ancient times this division was not a function of the machine process. It was not an outgrowth of a system of great factories, but of petty and medium-sized industry. Large-scale production was foreign to the ancient world, which never advanced beyond the stage of petty artis artisanry. Here is a different form of productive labor conditions, also based, as we have seen, on the system of technology. Even when we learn of great structures being raised, we must remember that they were often accomplished by means of petty labor. Thus, in the case of the construction of one of the great aqueducts at Rome, the government signed a contract with, th with 3,000 master masons. These worked together with their slaves, and in cases where production was on a comparatively large scale, it could, under the prevailing system of technology, exist only by making use of forces lying outside the economic system. For instance, slave labor, whole armies of slaves being imported after the conclusion of victorious wars, who were sold and distributed to the great estates and the slave-operated factories. Under a different system of technology, slave labor would have been impossible. The slaves spoil delicate machinery, and slave labor does not pay. Thus, even such a phenomenon as the labor of imported slaves can be explained under the given historical conditions by the tools with which social labor works. Or, to take another example, we know that, in spite of the rather high development of commercial capitalist conditions in ancient times, the economy of that period was on the whole a natural economy, payments in commodities in kind rather than in money. People were not in close economic relations. The exchange of commodities was much less developed than in our day. Great quantities of products were turned out in the great estates and in jail-like shops for their own consumption. This is also a definite stage of labor, a form of productive relation, and again the explanation is evident. It can be explained on the basis of the low development of the productive forces, the weakness of technology. Under such a technical system, it was difficult to attain a great excess production. In a word, it is evident that the relations between people and labor process are determined by the stage of advance and the evolution of technology.
the ancient economy was, as it were, adapted to the ancient technology. Let us compare this condition with that under capitalist society. Taking up in the first place the matter of technology, it is sufficient to cast a glance over a list of some of the branches of production. Let us consider only two of the groups of capitalist industry, the construction of machinery, instruments and apparatus as one branch and the electrotechnical industry as another branch. Here's the picture that presents itself. One manufacturer of machines, instruments and apparatus, A power machines, one locomotives, two stationary engines, three other power machines, B manipulating machinery in general use, one machines for working metals, wood, stone and other materials, two pumps, three lifting cranes and carrying machines, four other machines. C manipulating machinery in various special branches, one spinning machinery, two agricultural machinery, three special machinery for the obtaining of raw materials, four special machinery for the manufacture of arms and ammunition, five special machinery for turning out delicate products, six manufacture of various kinds of machines. D, repair shop machinery. E, boilers, appliances and inventory. One, steam boilers. Two, boilers, appliances and inventory for special branches, excluding working machinery. F, machine instruments and machine parts. One, machine tools. Two, machine part. G, mill construction. H, shipbuilding and the construction of marine machinery. I, the construction of airships and airplanes and their parts. J, gas tanks. K, production of vehicles. One, bicycles and their parts. Two, motor cars. Three, railroad cars. Four, wagon building and carriage building. Five, production of other means of transportation, not including water and air transportation. L, manufacture of clocks and watches and their parts. M, production of musical instruments. One, production of pianos. Two, production of other musical instruments and optical and other delicate mechanical devices, also the preparation of zoological and microscopical specimens. One, the preparation of optical and delicate mechanical instruments, including cameras and other photographic apparatus. Two, the production of surgical instruments and apparatus. Three, the production of zoological and microscopical apparatus. O, the production of globes and lamps, except such as are connected with the electrical industry. 2. Electrical industry. A. Manufacturer of dynamos and electromotors. B. Manufacturer of storage, batteries, and other batteries. C. Manufacturer of cables and insulated wire. D. Manufacturer of electrical measuring instruments, counters, and clocks. E. Manufacturer of el electrical apparatus and installation inventory. F. Manufacturer of lamps and searchlights. G. Manufacturer of electrical medical machinery. H. Manufacturer of weak current apparatus. I. Manufacturer of electrical insulating devices. J. Manufacturer of electrical products of great establishments. K. Repair stations for electrical products of all kinds. It is sufficient to compare this list with the machines spoken by or spoken of by Aristotle or Vitruvius to understand the tremendous difference between the technology of ancient society and that of modern capitalist society. Just as the ancient technology determined the ancient form of economy, so capitalist technology determines the present day capitalist economy. If we could enumerate the entire population, let us say of ancient Rome and of present day Berlin or London, and divide these populations into trades by their actual occupations, the profound gulf that separates us from ancient times would become apparent. We now have, as a result of our machine technology, types of workers that never existed in ancient times. Instead of the petty artisans, for instance, the Fabri Ferrari, we now find in our society electricians, machinists, machine constructors, boiler makers, engine lathe workers, phrasers, optical instrument makers, comp compos compositors, lithographers, railroad workers, locomotive engineers, firemen, steam hammer attendants, harvesting machinery workers, mowing machinery workers, sheaf binding machinery workers, tractor repairers, electrical engineers, chemists, specialists on steam boilers, linotypers, etc. 
etc., etc. These types of workers did not exist even in name, for no corresponding branch of production and consequently no appropriate tools of labor existed in this field in ancient times. But even if we take up those species of workers <clears throat> whose names are still the same and who existed in earlier days, we shall find that there is again a great difference. For instance, what is there in common between the present day weaver who works in a great textile factory and the artisan or slave weaver in ancient Greece or Rome? The latter would feel as much out of place in a modern factory as would Julius Caesar in a New York subway train. We have different labor forces of different labor skill. Our labor forces are the product of a different technology and they have become adapted to that technology. The existence of a great number of industrial branches which were not present in earlier times results chiefly in the fact that the division of labor today is entirely different. But the division of labor constitutes one of the fundamental conditions of production. The modern division of labor is determined by the modern instruments of labor, by the character, description, and combination of machines and tools, i.e. by the technical apparatus of capitalist society. The typical form of a modern industrial establishment is that of the large factory. We no longer have the small production unit, the artisan industry, nor even the domestic industry of the latif latifundium owner. We have instead a gigantic organization embracing thousands of persons distributed to their various posts in a definite order and performing their allotted tasks. If, as an example of a capitalist enterprise, we take Mr. Ford's automobile factory in Detroit. Its emphatically modern character is the first trait to strike the eye. A precise division of labor, much machinery, operating automatically under the supervision of the workers, <coughs> the strict adherence to a correct succession of operations, etc. Parts of the product, product are carried along by slowly moving belts or platforms, and the various types of workers at their machines execute their specific tasks on the partly finished articles as they go by. The entire labor process has been calculated down to the second. Each displacement of the worker, each motion of hand or foot, each inclination of the body all have been foreseen. The staff supervises the general course of the work. Everything goes by the clock, or rather the chronometer. Such is the division of labor and its scientific efficiency, according to the Taylor system. Such a factory, if we consider its human structure, i.e. the relations between the individuals composing it, also constitutes a productive relation in which the distribution of persons and their relation with each other are determined by the system of machinery, the combinations of machines, the technology, the organization of a factory inventory. <clears throat> the present development of technology must be considered as the dominating factor in the organization of labor. The machine does not stand alone in the factory. All the machines are arranged in groups. They are related to each other or, con or connected in their operations. The transfer of a job from one machine to another in the eyes of the technical supervisor is a calculable quantity. The labor plan, the distribution of location and labor, transportation are likewise precisely regulated, made automatic, standardized, and gradually changed into a precisely calculated mechanism of operative administration. In the general system of this movement of things, the movement of man turned out, also his influence on others, often to be a determining o oasis. There arose a system of scientific movement. An idea of the many branches of work in the great metal factories will be given by the branches found in Russian factories. Mechanical, electrical, blacksmith, boiler, molding, casting steel, iron foundry, iron rolling, heating metals, Martin blast furnaces, Siemens ovens, crucibles, carriages, chemical treatment of wood, construction work, auxiliary operations. The following categories of workers were found in the Putilov works in 1914 to 16. Locksmiths, lathe workers, milling machine workers, Planers, chis chiselers, borers, welders, stampers, 
You assemblers, blacksmiths, hammerers, pressers, pointers, stokers, furnace foremen, rollers, machinists, cutters, potters, molders, smelting furnace workers, paperers, joiners, carpenters, painters, tinsmiths, plumbers, cable workers, unskilled workers, men and women. <clears throat> Many of the names of these occupations show that they are bound to a specific instrument, tool, or machine, and a certain combination of these working in on merits and their distribution in the plant a certain distribution of men is also involved the latter being determined by the former precisely at the production relations in or precisely as the production relations in ancient greece or rome were an outgrowth of the system of technology characteristic of petty and medium production so the conditions of large-scale production in modern times are a result of the modern technology. Here again, there is a relative equilibrium between the social technology and the social economy. We have above observed that the poor technology of ancient times resulted in a poor exchange process, and that the economy remained for the most part economy in kind. The relation between the economies was very loose. Such were the definite production relations of antiquity. But modern capitalist technology permits the sending forth of huge quantities of products. The division of labor also has its influence in causing the entire production to be made for the market. For the manufacturer does not himself wear the millions of pairs of suspenders turned out by his factory. Therefore, the production conditions of the commodities economy are also a consequence of the technology of our day. We have approached the question from four different angles. First, the nature of the labor forces. Second, the distribution of labor between them. Third, the extent of production, i.e. of the organization of individuals in the various economies. Fourth, the relations between uh, these various economies. And in every case, we have seen from the example of the two different societies chosen, the ancient and the modern, that the combinations of the instruments of labor, the social technology, are the deciding factor in the combinations and relations of men, i.e. in social economy. But there is another phase of the production relations, namely the question of the social classes, which is to be discussed later in detail. Let us consider this question now from the standpoint of the production relations. In considering the relations of men in the production process, we observe everywhere, except in the so-called primitive communism, that the groupings of men are not accomplished in such manner as to cause the various groups to lie in a horizontal line, but rather in a vertical line. For example, in the condi conditions of medieval serfdom, we find at the top the owners of the estates, under them the administrators, mayors, supervisors, and at the bottom the peasants. In capitalist production relations, we find that men are not only distributed among molders, machinists, railroad workers, tobacco workers, etc., all of whom, in spite of the great differences between their tasks, are working along the same lines, occupying the same relative station in production. But we find that here, too, a number of persons stand above the others in the labor process, above the workers or the salaried employees the medium grade technical staff, master mechanics, engineers, specialists, agricultural experts, etc. Above these salaried men standing the higher officials or stand the higher officials, superintendents, directors. Above them are the so-called owners of enterprises, capitalists, the commanders in chief and controllers of the destinies of the production process. Let us also consider the latifundium of a rich Roman landlord. Here again, we find a regular gradation of persons. On the lowest rung of the ladder are the slaves, the speaking instruments, instrumenta vocalia, as the Romans termed them, termed them as distinguished from the semi-speaking instruments, instrumenta semivocalia, namely bleeding cattle and the mute instruments, instrumenta muta, in inanimate objects. Above the slaves stand the slave drivers, overseers, etc. Then come the superintendents. Finally, we have the owner of the lat latifundium himself with his honored family. His wife usually had charge of certain domestic operations. A blind man can see that we are dealing with differently constituted relations between persons at work. 
All the persons enumerated participate in one way or another in the labor process and therefore have certain definite relations to each other. In classifying them, we may divide them according to their trades and callings, but we may also divide them according to their classes. If our division is on the basis of occupations or callings, we shall have blacksmiths, locksmiths, lathe workers, etc. In the higher class, chemists, mechanics, boiler engineers, textile experts, locomotive specialists, etc. It is obvious that the locksmiths, lathe workers, machine workers, Steve Doors are in one class, while the engineer, the specialist, etc. are in another class. The capitalist, who has control of all, is again in another class. These persons can all, cannot all be thrown into the same pot. In spite of the division between the work performed by the locksmith, the turner, and the compositor, <clears throat> they all stand in the same relation to each other in the general labor process. Quite different is the, the relation between locksmith and engineer, or between locksmith and capitalist. Furthermore, the locksmith, turner, linotyper, individually and as a body, are in the same relation to all the engineers, and in the same remoter relation to all superintendents, captains of industry, capitalists. The greatest differences here are in the productive function, in the productive significance, in the character of the relations between men. The capitalist in his factory distributes and arranges his workers as he might things or tools, but the workers do not distribute the capitalists under the capitalist system of society. They are distributed by these capitalists. This is a relation of master and servant, as Marx says, with capital in command. It is their different function in the production process that constitutes the basis for the division of men into different social classes. An important point to be noted here is the nature of the relation between the process of production and that of distribution. Since we have seen that the latter is, so to speak, the reverse side of the social process of production. Concerning the subject of the process of distribution, Marx says the following. In the most shallow conception of distribution, the latter appears as a distribution of products and to that extent as further removed from and quasi independent of production. But before distribution means distribution of products, it is first a distribution of the means of production and second, what is practically another wording of the same fact. It is a distribution of the members of society among the various kinds of production, the subjection of individuals to certain conditions of production. The distribution of products is manifestly a result of this distribution, which is bound up with the process of production and, and determines the organization of the latter. To treat of production apart from the dis, to, to treat production apart from the distribution which is comprised in it is mainly an idle abstraction. Conversely, we know the character of the distribution of products the moment we are given the nature of that other distribution which forms originally a factor of production. <clears throat> These sentences of Marx deserve more of our attention. We find, first of all, that the process of the production of products determines the process of the distribution of products. If, for example, production is carried on in independent establishments by various capitalist enterprises or by individual artisans, each, establish each establishment no longer produces all of its requirements, but turning out some special product, watches, grain, iron locks, hammers, tongs, etc., as the case may be, it is obvious that the distribution of the product will take the form of exchange. Persons producing locks cannot clothe themselves in such locks or consume them for dinner, nor can persons producing grain lock their barns with grain. They must have locks and keys for, their pur for this purpose. The manner of production which is followed also determines the manner of distributing the product. This distribution may not be considered as independent of production. On the contrary, it is determined by production and together with it constitutes a section of material social reproduction. But production itself involves two further distributions. First, the distribution of persons, their arrangement in the production process, depending on their function as already discussed. Second, the distribution of production tools among these persons. 
These distributions are a part of production or, in the words of Marx, are involved in production. We have seen, for example, in one of the systems of society discussed, namely capitalist society, that its distribution of persons also includes a division into classes based on the difference of function in the productive process. But this varying distribution of persons, depending on their varying assignment in production, is also connected with a distribution of the means of labor. The capitalist, the owner of the latifundium, and the estate owner control these means of labor, factory and machinery, the estate and the compulsory shops, the soil and its structures. While the worker has no instruments of production aside from his own labor power, the slave does not even own his own body, nor does the peasant serf. It is therefore obvious that the varying function of classes in production is based on the distribution of instruments among them. In his review of Marx's book, A Contribution to the Critique of Political Economy, Engels says, an, an economy deals not with things, but with relations between persons, and in the last analysis between classes. But these relations always are bound up with things and appear as things. For example, the current class relations in capitalist society, namely the relations between capitalists and workers, are bound up with a thing, the instruments of production in the hands of the capitalists, controlled by the latter, not owned by the workers. These instruments of production serve the capitalists as tools for the obtaining of profits, as means of exploiting the working class. They are not mere things, they are things in a special social significance, in that they here serve not only as means of production, but also as a means of exploiting wage laborers. In other words, this thing expresses the relation between classes, or in other words, or in the words of Engels, these class relations are bound up with the thing. In the last analysis, this thing in our example is capital. The special form of production relations, therefore, existing in the relations between classes, is determined by the varying function of these groups of persons in the production process, and the distribution of the means of production among them. This fully conditions the distribution of the products. The capitalist obtains profit because he owns instruments of production, because he is a capitalist. The class relations in production, i.e. the relations bound up with the varying distribution of the means of production, are particularly important in society. It is they which determine in the first place the outline of society, its system, or in the words of Marx, its, its economic structure. Now the production relations are extremely numerous and varied. If we recall furthermore that we are considering the distribution of products as a portion of reproduction, it also becomes clear that the relations between persons in the process of distribution are also included in the production relations. In a complicated system of society, there are innumerable such relations such as between merchants, bankers, clerks, brokers, tradesmen of all kinds, workers, consumers, salesmen, traveling salesmen, Messengers, manufacturers, ship owners, sailors, engineers, unskilled workers, etc., etc., which all constitute production relations. All are interwoven in the most varied combinations, the most peculiar patterns, the most unusual confusions. But the fundamental scheme of all these patterns is important, namely the relations between the great groups known as social classes. The system of society will depend on the classes included in society, their mutual position, their functions in the production process, the distribu distribution of instruments of labor. We have a capitalist society if the capitalist is on top. We have a slave system if the estate owner is on top and in control of everything. We have a dictatorship of the proletariat if the workers are on top. To be sure, even the absence of all classes would not mean the disappearance of society, but merely the disappearance of class society. There were no classes, for example, in the priv primitive communist society, nor will there be any in the communist society of the future. We observed above that the production relations change with the social technology. A glance at the actual historical development of any society will be sufficient to show that this principle also holds good in such production relations as are simultaneously class relations. Great shifts of classes have taken place, for instance, before the eyes of the present generation. 
Not many decades ago, there was still a considerable class of independent artisans, which subse subsequently declined because of the growth of the machine technology and consequently of large-scale production of the factory system. Simultaneously, the proletariat increased, as did also the industrial upper bourgeoisie, while the small artisan disappeared. The class alignment necessarily changed, for with the changes in technology, there are also associated changes in the distribution of labor in society. Certain functions in production disappear or fall into the background. New functions arise, etc. Simultaneously, class groups are altered. In a society given or in a society having a low stage of the productive forces, industry will not be highly developed, while the social economy will still be rural and agricultural in character. It will not surprise us to find the rural classes predominating in such a society, with the class of country squires standing at the head. <clears throat> On the other hand, in a society with highly developed productive forces, we shall find a mighty industry, cities, factories, villages, etc., with the urban classes attaining great influence. The landed proprietor yields place to the industrial bourgeoisie or other sections of the bourgeoisie. The proletariat becomes a great power. A constantly progressing realignment of classes may totally change the form of society. This will particularly be the case if the class at the bottom comes out on top, a process which is to be described in the following chapters. For the present, we shall merely state that class relations also, the most important part of production relations, change with the changes in the productive forces. These social relations between the producers and the conditions under which they exchange their activities and share in the total act of production will naturally vary according to the character of the means of production. With the discovery of a new instrument of war warfare, the firearm, the whole internal organization of the army was necessarily altered. The relations within which individuals compose an army and can work as an army were transformed, and the relation of different armies to one another was likewise changed. We thus see that the social relations within which individuals produce, the social relations of production, are altered, transformed with the change and development of the material means of production of the forces of production. In other words, the organization of any specific society is, de is determined by the condition of its productive forces. With an alteration of this condition, the social organization also will necessarily change sooner or later. Social organization is therefore in unstable equilibrium at all points where the social forces of production are growing. The totality of the production relations, therefore, is the economic structure of society or its mode of production. This is the human labor apparatus of society, its real basis. A consideration of the production relations will show that they depend on the manner in which the persons involved are distributed in space. The relation is expressed in the fact that each perso persona's, already person persona's already shown has its place as a screw in the mechanism of a watch. It is precisely this definite situation in space and the theater of labor that makes of this arrangement, this distribution, a social relation of labor. No doubt every object is situated in space, moves in space, but here men are joined, particularly by the def definiteness of their working positions as it were. This is a material relation like that of the parts in the mechanism of a watch. We must not overlook the fact that the critics of historical materialism are constantly confusing terms because the word material has a number of meanings. Thus, the historical process, for instance, is traced back to material needs or interests, whereupon the refutation of historical materialism is proclaimed since it has been rightly shown that interest is not a material thing in the philosophical sense of the word, but obviously psychical. We admit that interest is not matter, but it is too bad that even certain advocates of historical materialism who usually associate Marx with some bourgeois philosopher, since they are opposed to philosophical materialism, are guilty of such a confusion in terms. Max Adler, for instance, 
who weds Marx to Kant, regards society as a totality of psychical interactions. For him, everything is psych psychical. Here is a specimen of this nature. A relation is, however, by no means matter in the sense of philosophical materialism, which puts matter on the same level with psychic substances. It is always difficult to find a relation between the economic structure, the material element of historical materialism, and the matter of the former theory, no matter how this theory be understood. And what is true of the cause is also true of the effect. Instruments of production are rather products of the human mind. Zetterbaum is confused by the fact that machines are not made by soulless men, but as men themselves are not begotten by corpses, he considers everything in society to be a product of spirit without body, a very virtuous spirit, therefore. It follows that the machine is psychical and society has no matter, but it is obvious that sinful flesh is somewhere involved, for even a sinless spirit could not beget men and machines. Furthermore, a fleshless spirit would not even desire to occupy himself with such affairs. What remains of the relation? You must again point out to Herr Zetterbaum that the solar system is a material system, that we call it a system because its parts, sun, earth, other planets, are in definite relations to each other, occupy a certain position in space at any given moment. Just as the totality of planets in certain relations with each other constitutes the solar system, so the totality of persons in production relations constitutes the economic structure of society. Its material basis, its personal apparatus, or its personal apparatus. <clears throat> Kosky, who sometimes confuses technology and economy most sinfully, also makes some very vulnerable statements. All such claims may be answered by the following passage from the arch-bourgeois Werner Sambast. This professor, who is quite free from materialism, tells us, Figuratively speaking, the economic life may be considered as an organism consisting of a body and a soul. The external forms of the operations of the economic life are its body, the forms of economic and factory operation, the most varied organizations within which and with the aid of which the economic process continues. Of course, the entire economic structure of society must be included under the head of economic form and economic organization being therefore, figuratively speaking, the body of this society. D. The Outlines of the Superstructure among the remaining phases of social life, which we must now consider are such phenomena as the social and political system of society, the state, the organization of classes, parties, etc., manners, customs, and morals, the social norms of human conduct, science and philosophy, religion, art, and finally, language, the means of communication between men. These phenomena, excepting the social and political system, are frequently referred to as our mental or spiritual culture. The word culture comes from a Latin verb meaning to cultivate. Culture, therefore, means everything that is the work of human hands in the wider sense, i.e. everything produced by social man in one form or another. Mental culture is also a product of the social life, is included in the general life process of society. <clears throat> it cannot be understood unless it be interpreted as a portion of this general life process. Yet certain bourgeois scholars would isolate this mental culture absolutely from the life process of society, i.e. they would deify it, make it an, an entity independent of the body, a disembodied spirit. Thus, Alfred Weber, in, or, yeah, who considers the expansion of social life, its intricacy and wealth as a process of external civilization writes, but we feel today that culture is superior to all these things, that culture means something different to us. Only when life rising above its necessities and utilities has assumed a higher level than these things, only then have we a culture. In other words, culture is a portion of life, but is not determined by the necessities and utilities of life, i.e. it transcends the bounds of society, is not conditioned by this society. It is obvious that such a point of view would lead to a renunciation of science and an acceptance of faith. 
Note that Weber's chief proof is the fact that we feel. A useful transition to a consideration of this mental culture is a study in broad outline of the social and political structure of society, which is directly determined, as we shall see, by its economic structure. The most obvious expression of the social and political structure of society is the state power, which will be understood if we understand the, nece the necessary condition for the existence of a society of classes. For in such a society, the various classes must have different interests. Some possess all, others practically nothing. Some are in command and appropriate to themselves the products of the works of others. Others obey, carry out the commands of strangers, and yield up what they have produced with their own hands. The position of the classes in production and distribution, i.e. the condition of their existence, is their function in society. Their social being results also in the growth of a specific consciousness. As everything in the universe is the result of the conditions that bring it about, the various situations of the classes must result in a difference in their interests, aspirations, struggles, even in their death struggles. It is interesting to observe the nature of the equilibrium existing in the structure of a society of classes. The fact that such a society in which, in the words of an English statesman, there are in reality two nations, classes, can exist at all without danger of disintegrating at any moment is of itself very striking. Yet there is no doubt of the existence of class societies. In some way or other, a unifying bond has been attained in such societies, a sort of hoop holding together the staves of the barrel. This hoop is the state, an organization of all society, with its threads retaining them all in the system of its tentacles. If we should ask how the state originates, we should not be satisfied with any answer attributing a supernatural origin to the state, nor with any declaration that the state stands beyond all classes. For the simple reason that classless persons do not exist in a classless so or in a class society. There would therefore be no material with which to construct an organization standing outside of all classes or above all classes, no matter how often this may be asserted by bourgeois scholars. The organization of the state is altogether an organization of the ruling class. It now becomes of interest to determine which is the ruling class, for we shall then understand which class is represented by the state power, which subjugates all other classes by means of its strength, its force, its mental system, its widely ramified apparatus. The question is not difficult to answer. In capitalist society, we find the capitalist class dominant in production. It would be absurd to expect to find the proletariat permanently dominant in the state, for one of the fundamental conditions of equilibrium would not be lacking would now be lacking. Either the proletariat was, would also seize the control of production, or the bourgeoisie would seize the state power. The existence of a society with a specific economic structure also involves the adaptation of its state organization. In other words, the economic structure of society also determines its state and political structure. The state, furthermore, is a huge organization embracing an entire nation and ruling many millions of men. This organization needs a whole army of employees, officials, soldiers, officers, legislators, jurists, ministers, judges, generals, etc., etc., and embraces great layers of human beings, one superimposed on the other. This structure is a precise reflection of the conditions in production. In capitalist society, for example, the bourgeoisie is in control of production, and therefore also of the state. Following upon the manufacturer comes the factory superintendent himself, often a capitalist. The same is true of the ministers of a capitalist state, its politicians in high places. From these circles are recruited the generals for the army. The intermediate positions in production are filled by the technical specialist, the engineer, the technical mental worker. These mental workers occupy the posts of intermediate officials in the state apparatus. They often furnish the army officers. The lower employees, as well as the soldiers, are furnished by the working class. Of course, there are many fluctuations, but the structure of the state authority corresponds closely, on the whole, to the structure of society. If we should assume for a moment that by a miracle, the lower employees 
had raised themselves above the higher employees, our assumption would involve a loss of equilibrium in the whole of society, i.e. a revolution. But such a revolution also cannot take place unless corresponding alter alterations have already been accomplished in production. Here also it is apparent that the structure of the state apparatus itself reflects the economic structure, i.e. the same classes occupy relatively the same positions. Let us give a few examples from various times and places. In ancient Egypt, the, in, the administration of production was practically identical with that of the state, the great landlords heading both. An important fraction of production was that turned out by the landlord state. The role of the social groups in production coincided with their caste, with whether they were higher, middle, or lower officials of the state or slaves. The families of the great are, of course, landholding families, but they are also, above all, a bureaucratic nobility. Sometimes the combination of the state authority and leadership in production was emphatically formulated. In the 15th century, the banking house of the Medici, Med, Medici, Med, or Medici, Medici ruled the Italian trade capitalist Republic of Florence. The Bank of the Medici and the Florentine State Treasury were identical. The bankruptcy of this commercial firm occurred at the same moment as the collapse of the Florentine Republic. In the second half of the 18th century, the landlords were dominant in Russian production, ruling over the peasant serfs. These landlords, therefore, also controlled the state, being specially organized as a privileged nobility. When the peasants rose under P Pugakov, the landlord empress Catherine II served as an incarnation of the existing state power when she aided, as landholder of Kazan, in forming a cavalry regiment for putting down this rabble, wherewith she aroused a veritable storm of imperial fidelity among the Kazan landlords. Her frequent association with the French free-thinking philosophers did not prevent Catherine from introducing serfdom into Ukraine, a contrast which has been well stated by A. Tol uh, Tolstoy. The great population in your lands longs for freedom from your hands. Then spake the full of noble zeal, Monsieur vows me com complaise, whereupon she extended serfdom to cover Ukraine also. In the United States, financial capital, a clique of bankers and trust magnates, is dominant in production. They also control the state power to such an extent that congressional decisions are not made before they have been most thoroughly discussed behind the scenes by combined capital. But the social and political structure of society is not limited to the state authority. The ruling class, as well as the oppressed classes, present the most varied organizations and forms of common action. Each class usually has its vanguard, consisting of its most class-conscious members, and constituting the political parties competing for domination in society. Usually, the ruling class, the oppressed classes, and the middle classes each have their specific party. Since there are various groups existing within each class, it is obvious that a class may have a number of parties, though the most permanent and fundamental of its interests can be expressed only in one party. Besides the regularly organized bodies, there may be a number of other bodies. The present-day American capitalists, for example, have not only organizations to combat the workers, but also special organizations for election manipulations and organizations for recruiting strike breakers, organizations of industrial spies, the secret groups of the most influential capitalist firms and the most powerful politicians following strictly cons conspirative methods. The official state organs always carry out the will of these bodies. In Russia, there was an auxiliary organization of the state of the landed proprietors, namely the semi-criminal band of the Black Hundred, which had affiliations with the reigning Romanov dynasty. This role was played in Italy in 1921 by the Fascisti and in Germany by the Orgesch. The oppressed classes also have a number of economic organizations in addition to their parties, for instance the trade unions, not to mention fighting organizations and clubs in which we may include such bodies as the bands of Stenka Razin or Pugakov. 
In short, all organizations waging the class war from the jeunesse dorée of the German student fraternities up to the state power itself, on the one hand from the party to the club, on the other hand, all these are a portion of the social and political structure of society. Their basis is as clear as day. Their existence is a reflection and an expression of classes. Here also economy conditions politics. In our consideration of this political superstructure, we cannot afford to lose sight of the fact that, as the above examples alone would show, this political superstructure is not merely a personal apparatus. It consists for all society of a combination of things, persons, and ideas. For instance, in the state apparatus, we have a specific apparatus of things, a specific hierarchy, a certain specific system of ideas, procedures, laws, ordinances, etc., etc. In the case of the army, which is a portion of the state, we have a special technology, cannons, rifles, machine guns, commissary supplies, its specific arrangement of men distributed in a certain way and its own ideas, which have been insinuated into the minds of all the members of the army by means of a complicated military drill and a special educational apparatus, spirit of subordination, discipline, etc. Viewed from this angle, the picture of the army will suggest the following inferences. The technology of the army is determined by the general technology of productive labor in the given society. Cannons cannot be manufactured before the casting of steel has been learnt, i.e. before the necessary means of production have been obtained. The distribution of persons, the structure of the army, depends on the military science and also the class alignment of society. On the existence of weapons and on the nature of these weapons depends the division of the army into artillery, infantry, engineers, cavalry, sappers, etc. On this will depend what types of soldiers, superiors, persons with special functions, for example, telephone operators, are present in the army. On the other hand, the, the class alignment of society will determine from what social layer the staff of officers is recruited by the representatives of what class the actions of the army are controlled, etc. Finally, the specific mental attitudes with which the army is imbued are conditioned on the one hand by the army structure, memorizing regulations, cadaver obedience, etc., and on the other hand by the class structure of society. In the Tsar's army, the slogan was, Obey the Tsar. For God, Emperor, and Fatherland, in the Red Army, the slogan is, Preserve discipline in order to protect the workers against the imperialists. These examples are sufficient to show that the social and political superstructure is a complicated thing, consisting of different elements, which are interrelated. On the whole, this structure is determined by the class outline of society, a structure which in turn depends on the productive forces, i.e. on the social technology. Certain of these elements are directly dependent on technology, the art of war. Others depend on the class character of society, its economy, as well as on the technology of the superstructure itself, army management. All the elements of the superstructure are therefore directly or indirectly based on the stage that has been reached by the social productive forces. A special, a special place among human organizations is held by the organization of the family, i.e. the living together of men, women, and children. This clan organization, which was constantly changing, was based on certain economic conditions. The family also is not only a social, but preeminently an economic form formation based on the division of labor between man and woman, on sexual differentiation. Primitive marriage is nothing else than the expression of this economic union. <sighs> the family thus arises as a firm unit by reason of the alterations in the economic order of the clan, which was a primitive state of communism. The original form of relation between the sexes was promiscuity, i.e. unregulated sexual relations between men and women. M. N. Pokrovsky characterizes the primitive Slavic family as follows. The members of this family, workers in the same economy, soldiers of the same detachment, and finally, worshippers of the same god, participants in the same rite. But the economic basis of such a family is further clarified by the following fact. It would be erroneous to assign a dominant importance to these 
to these, says M.N. Pokrovsky, blood ties. They are customary but not inevitable. Such collective establishments were conducted in the north of Russia by persons who were strangers to each other on the basis of contracts. They founded such communities, not for all time, but for a definite period, for instance, for 10 years. Here also the economic connection antedates the ties of blood, the relation in our sense of the term. The changed forms of family relations um, in accordance with the economic conditions may be traced even in modern times. We need only to compare the peasant family, the worker's family, and the modern bourgeois family. The peasant family is a firm unit, for it is based directly on production. There must be a woman in the house, for who else would milk the cows, feed the pigs, cook the food, tidy the rooms, wash, take care of the children, etc. The economic significance of the family is so great that marriages are dictated by specific economic calculation. There is no woman in the house. Economically considered, the members of the family are workers and eaters. Built up on this comparatively rigid basis, the peasant family is itself characterized by patriarchal rigidity when untouched by the corrupting influence of the city. The worker's family is different. The worker has no economy of his own. His household is a consumption economy only. It consumes its wages. Simultaneously, the city with its saloons, restaurants, laundries, etc., makes the household largely superfluous. Finally, large-scale industry disintegrates the family, forcing the proletarian woman to work in a factory. More mobile, less stable forms of family relations arise from these circumstances. In the upper middle class, private property requires the preservation of the family, but the increasing parasitism of the bourgeoisie and the growth of entire strata who live by cutting coupons transform the wife into a thing, into a bedizened but very stupid plaything, a boudoir, a boudoir appurtenance. The various forms of marriage, monogamy, polygamy, polyandry, etc., are likewise dependent on the conditions of, ec of economic evolution. Furthermore, it must not be forgotten that sexual intercourse has practically never been limited to the family. The forms of prostitution and their distribution are again connected with the economy of society. We need only to point out the role of prostitution in the capitalist system. It seems reasonable to assume that communist society, which will definitely abolish private property and the enslavement of women, will witness the disappearance both of prostitution and the family. The other phases of the superstructure are a result of man's living in society or in individual sections of society in a condition either of outright conflict or of incomplete harmony. The expression of this condition is the social necessity of social norms, including customs, morals, law, and a great number of other standards, uh, rules of decent behavior, etiquette, ceremonial, etc., also the constitutions of the various societies, organizations, brotherhoods, etc., all of which are produced by the accumulation of contradictions in a mature and complicated society. The most striking of these contradictions is the class contradiction, which therefore demands a mighty regular regulator for the purpose of suppressing this contradiction at certain times. The state power with its legal decisions, its standards of law, constitutes such a regulator. There are also subsidiary contradictions between the classes, within the classes, also within trades, groups, organizations, and in all human categories in general. Regardless of his class position, each individual comes in contact with all kinds of people, is subject to various influences which interact at many points. He finds himself placed in swiftly changing circumstances, which may disappear and later again assert themselves. Contradictions are here found at every step, and yet society and certain groups within it continue their relatively permanent existence. The capitalists, owners of enterprises, traders, merchants compete in the market, yet they rarely resort to armed conflict with each other within the same state, and their class does not collapse because of the competitive struggle between its members. 
While buyers and sellers have distinctly opposed interests, they do not belabor each other physically. There are unemployed persons among the workers whom the capitalists attempt to win over during a strike, but not every such person can be utilized. The class bond among the workers is too strong. This condition is a result of a great variety of standards existing by the side of the legal standards. These supplementary norms impress themselves on the minds of men, apparently from some inner source and appear sacred to them, being vol voluntarily adhered to. Of such nature, for example, are the rules of morality, which are represented in a commercial society as eternal and immutably sacred laws, radiating their own light and binding on all decent people. Similar is the case with customs, duties to the great departed, rules of decency, courtesy, etc. In spite of the alleged supernatural character of these laws, their earthly roots may easily be traced, regardless of the pious awe of all their submissive adherents. A closer ob observation forces us to recognize two fundamental conditions. First, that these laws are, are subject to change. Second, that they are connected with class, group, occupation, etc. It is also obvious that, in the last analysis, they are likewise conditioned by the level attained by the productive forces. In general, these rules indicate the line of conduct conducive to a preservation of the society, class, or group in question, and requiring a subordination of the individual to the interests of the group. These norms are therefore conditions of equilibrium for holding together the internal contradictions of human social systems, whence it results that they must more or less coincide with the economic structure of society. It is impossible, for instance, in any society for the system of its dominant manners and customs to be in permanent contradiction with its fundamental economic structure. Such an opposition would mean the complete absence of the fundamental condition for social equilibrium. It is on the basis of the economic conditions that law, customs, and morals are evolved in any society. They change and disappear with the economic system. Thus, in capitalist society, the capitalist controls things, instruments of production, a condition which is reflected in the laws of the capitalist state and the so-called right to private property, which is protected by the entire apparatus of the state power. The production conditions of capitalist society are juridically termed property relations. These relations are supported by many laws. A condition under which the laws of capitalist society would not protect the property relations of the society, but destroy them, is inconceivable. Similarly, the moral consciousness of capitalist society reflects and expresses its material being. Thus, in the field of private property, morality teaches that theft is to be condemned. Honesty and the inviolability of the property of others are inculcated. And quite naturally, for without this moral law which has embedded itself in the minds of men, capitalist society would at once disintegrate. Apparent contradictions to the above can be easily disposed of. While communists do not believe in the sacredness of private property, they do not approve of stealing. It may be urged that this indicates the presence of something that is sacred for all men that cannot be explained by earthly causes. The facts of the case are quite different. It is true that communists by no means recognize the inviolability of private property. The nationalization of factories is an expropriation of, of the bourgeoisie. The working class appropriates the property of others, transgresses the right of private property, undertakes a despotic intervention in the right of property. But communists condemn stealing for the reason that individual thefts by each worker from the capitalists for his own advantage would not result in a common struggle who would make the worker a petty bourgeois. <clears throat> yeah. Horse thieves and swindlers will not fight in the class struggle, even though they may, not, may be offspring of the proletariat. If many members of the proletariat should become thieves, the class would break down and be condemned to impotence. Therefore, communists condemn stealing, not in order to protect private property, but in order to maintain the integrity of their class, to protect it from demoralization and disintegration, without which protection, the proletariat can never be transformed into the next following stage. We are therefore dealing with a class standard in the conduct of the proletariat. 
it is obvious that the rules we have considered are determined by the economic conditions of society. The proletarian standards, of course, are in contradiction with the economic conditions of capitalist society. But we have been speaking of dominant standards. As soon as the proletarian standards become dominant, capitalism will be a thing of the past. A number of examples will be given to explain the above statements. In the sexual field, at a certain stage of development, when the clan was still based on bland relationship and members of other clans were considered enemies, marriages between close relations were not objectionable. Particularly sacred was a marriage with one's mother or daughter in the ancient Iranian religion. When the productive forces were at a low level and the social economy could not afford any superfluous ballast, manners and morals required the slaying of old men, as is reported by the ancient historians Herodotus, Strabo, etc. This was the, the cause for the voluntary self-poisonings, reported by Strabo, of old men. On the other hand, where these old men had a function in production or administration, morality required that they be honored. The close-knit nature of the clan, its solidarity when combating enemies, assumed the form of blood revenge, in which women also participated. Thus, we read in the Nibble, Nibble on Genlid, <laughs> Cremilda did revenge her wrongs in way that will affright. She slaughtered without fear or shame the king and loyal knight. They both were singly manacled in fast and jury place, so that those knights ne'er saw again each other face to face, save when she took her brother's head to Hagen with it with own hand, Cremelda, vengeful wrath was such as baffles ailed command or ail command. Edward Meyer correctly says, in content the laws of morality, of customs, and of justice depend on the social order and the communal views of the community prevailing at the time. They may therefore be diametrically opposed in content if they represent different societies and different periods. In ancient China, a peculiar, peculiar, peculiarly constructed feudal state authority with a great stratum of officials of various degree was of great importance. The rule of this feudal bureaucratic stratum was ideologically based on the teaching of Confucius, a system of rules of conduct. One of the most important points in this moral teaching was the doctrine of respect and submission to those in authority. <clears throat> Calumnies must be borne, even though they drive us into death. If the honor of the master require it, one can and should always make good all the master's errors by faithful service, such with Hiao. Violation of Hiao was the only sin. One who did not understand this, who therefore had to grasp of propriety, had no grasp of propriety, a fundamental conception in the Confucian doctrine, was a barbarian. Respect how towards one's feudal lord was enumerated together with that toward parents, teachers, superiors in the official hierarchy, and office holders in general. Discipline, like respect, is a worthy virtue insubordination is worse than baseness. The case may be generally stated, better be a dog in peace than a man living in anarchy, as Cheng Ki Tong says. Like any code for officials, the Confucian Code, of course, also condemned any participation by officials in business, directly or indirectly, as ethically objectionable and not in accord with their rank. Friends must be chosen only from one's own rank, for they can fulfill all these ceremonies. The population consists of stupid men, as contrasted with the man of princely station. Characteristically enough, this entire system of standards supporting the feudal noble regime was called the Great Plan. It is obvious that this, that this teaching is closely related with the system of society. The numerous Chinese ceremonies were in reality based on the dominant currents of thoughts and served as a comp complicated silken tissue enmeshing the social structure and guarding the existing order. Or let us consider the medieval knights of northern France in the 12th and 13th centuries who sang of their fair ladies and fought tournaments for them. Their ideal views of honor and love bore all the earmarks of a caste, a caste honor. 
The chief role played by knighthood in society was that of war and strategy. The standards, therefore, had to serve the purpose of training a military type of man, segregated in a special class. A knight who had shown himself to be a coward was cast out, publicly outlawed by the herald, cursed by the church. His escutcheon and arms were destroyed by the hangman, his shield tied to the tail of a horse and smashed by the animal in his swift course. For training in the profession of arms, there were tournaments in addition to military campaigns and feuds. As the capitalist relations grow, the dominant customs, morals, etc. change. Generous wastefulness is replaced by a desire for accumulation and the corresponding virtues. A decent man is not honored by his lordly manner, but by his keeping order in his establishment. One must refrain from revelry, must appear only in decent company, must not be addicted to drinking, gambling, women. Must be, one must be a good citizen even if one's external conduct for reasons of business interest, even in one's external conduct for reasons of business interest. For such a moral conduct of life raises one's credit. Of course, this pious Protestant morality was succeeded by a different morality when the situation of the bourgeoisie changed, the business of the firm no longer depending on the conduct of its owner. It is an even easier matter to show how law changes with the economic structure, for here the class character of law is manifest everywhere. But even such intangible standards as those of fashion depend, as may be easily proved, on social conditions. For a bourgeois it is indecent not to dress in accordance with his standing, for this class trait of clothing indicates persons of quality. Even revolutionists are subject to the caprices of fashion. A party fashion in the revolution of 1905 was the wearing of black blouses by the Social Democrats, a sign of the proletariat, while the social revolutionists preferred red ones, revolutionary peasantry. You could hardly find a dozen intellectuals in any big city who had participated in the revolution and yet ignored these passively accepted party fashions. In addition to a class morality, we also have subdivisions of this morality. For example, professional ethics, the vocational morals of physicians, lawyers, etc. There is also a thief morality, there is honor among thieves, which is rather strictly complied with. All the standards above mentioned constitute firm bonds emphasizing the unity of a society, a class, a vocational group, etc. Science and philosophy are also a category of social phenomena. We shall see that the latter is based on all the accomplishments of the former. Any fairly advanced science is a very complicated thing, not limited to systems of ideas alone. The sciences have their technique, their physical apparatus, instruments, appliances, charts, books, laboratories, museums, etc. Any labo laboratory or any scientific expedition to the North Pole or to Central Africa will serve as an illustration. They also have their personal apparatus, sometimes highly organized. For example, scientific congresses, conferences, academies, and other organizations with their periodical and other publications. And finally, there is the system of ideas, of thoughts in orderly arrangement, constituting the science in the proper sense of the word. <clears throat> the following principle is of fundamental importance. Every science is born from practice, from the conditions and needs of the struggle for life on the part of social man with nature and of the various social groups, with the elemental forces of society or with other social groups. The savage has had the most varied experiences. He can distinguish venomous and edible plants, pursue the traces of game and protect himself from beasts of prey and venomous serpents. He can make use of fire and water, select stones and wood for his weapons, smelt and work metals. He can count and calculate with his fingers, make measurements with his hands and feet like a child. He sees the firmament, observes its motions and the changed positions of sun and planets. All or most of his observations are made casually or for the purpose of a useful application. <clears throat> These primitive observations are the germ of the various sciences. The latter can only exist when freedom from material 
cares has resulted in a sufficient quantity of comfort and leisure, and when the intellect has been sufficiently strengthened by frequent use, to make observations per se a matter of interest. Science, therefore, can begin only when the growth of the productive forces has left free time for scientific observation. Also, the original material of science is material taken from the field of production. It should therefore not surprise us that the immediate maintenance of life by production, i.e. the interest, interests of production, <clears throat> gave the first impulse to the growth of science. Practice created theory and impelled it onward. <clears throat> Astronomy arose from the need of finding one's bearings by the stars in desert plains, from the significance of the seasons in agriculture, the need of a precise division of time, and astronomical control of clocks, for instance, etc. Physics was intimately connected with the technique of material production and warfare. Chemistry arose on the basis of an expanding industrial production, particularly mining. The beginnings of chemistry are already found in Egypt and China, in the manufacture of glass, dyeing, enameling, the production of paints, metallurgy, etc. The word chemistry is derived from chemi, black, thus suggesting its Egyptian origin. <clears throat> Alchemy is found among the ancient Egyptians, the outgrowth of the desire to find the law of transmutation of metals into gold. In the 15th century, chemistry was much aided by medicine. Mineralogy arises from the use of metals in production and their study for purposes of production. Botany originally consisted of a knowledge of healing plants, leader of useful plants, still leader of plants in general. Zoology developed from the necessity of understanding the useful and harmful qualities of animals. Anatomy, physiology, pathology started from practical medicine. The first specialists in this field were Egyptian, East Indian, Greek, and Roman physicians, such as the Greek Hippocrates, the Roman Claudius Galenus, etc. <clears throat> Geography and ethnography were developed by trade and colonial warfare. The ablest commercial peoples of antiquity, for instance, the Phoenicians, Carthag Carthaginians, etc., were also the best geographers. Geography was neglected in the Middle Ages, a great renewal, renewal of interest in the subject coming in modern times, beginning with the 15th century. In the era of the colonial wars waged by the trade capitalist nations and the half commercial, half predatory, half scientific voyages, voyages connected with these wars. <laughs> the voyages and discoveries were performed chiefly by the predatory commercial nations, Portugal, Spain, England, Holland. Ethnology was also encouraged by colonial policy, the practical question being the learning of a method of utilizing savages for labor for the advantage of the civilized bourgeoisie. Mathematics, the science that is apparently most remote from practice, was nevertheless of practical origin. Its original tools were those first used in material production. The fingers, hands, feet, counting on one's fingers. The quaternary, decimal, vis, vis, visionary system. <clears throat> the original designations for the angles, etc. After the bend in the knee, units of length, the L, foot, etc. The material basis of mathematics was the needs of production, surveying. Geometry means earth measurement. The erection of buildings, measuring the content of vessels, shipbuilding. Still earlier, the number of cattle. In the commercial period, commercial arithmetic, inventory, balance sheet, etc. The Egyptian and Greek geometers, the Roman agrimensors, the Alexandrian engineers, for instance, Hero of Alexandria, who invented a sort of steam engine, were simultaneously the first mathematicians. The case of the social sciences, as already discussed in our introduction, is in no way different. History arose from the need of knowing the destinies of nations for purposes of practical politics. Legal science began with the collection and codification of the most important laws, again for practical purposes. 
Political economy arose with capitalism originally as a science of merchants serving the needs of their class policy. The philological sciences arose in the form of grammars of the various languages as a result of commercial relations and the requirements of intercourse. Statistics began with merchants tables, each dealing with a specific country. Likewise, the first beginnings of political economy. One of the earliest economists, William Petty, calls one of his works political arithmetic, etc., etc. <clears throat> New sciences are arising from production before our very eyes. For instance, the technical experiences acquired in the application of the Taylor system give rise to so called psychotechniques or techniques. The psychophysiology of labor, the theory of organization of production, etc. With the gradual extension, division, and specialization of the sciences, their direct or indirect dependence on the stage of the productive forces nevertheless continues in evidence. As the natural human organs in the direct process of material production in society are extended, and by this extension, contrary to the Bible, are enabled to embrace and manipulate a much greater material, so the extended consciousness of human society in s is science, increasing its mental compass and enabling it to grasp and consequently better to control a greater mass of phenomena. It is interesting to note that many bourgeois scholars, when speaking concretely of science, involuntarily assume this materialist standpoint. <clears throat> but they dare not pursue it to the end. Thus, a well-known Russian scholar, Professor Chuprov, Jr., speaks of the significance of science as follows. While life remains uncomplicated, men in their daily affairs content themselves with the experiences of life, an accidental method of accumulating incoherent bits of knowledge and habit, passed on from father to son as a tradition. But as the sphere of interest widens, these formless bits of knowledge cease to fulfill requirements. There arises a need for systematic work, consciously and planfully devoted to an understanding of the surrounding universe, i.e. science. As soon as men have learned that science and human knowledge are identical, and that that which appears as cause and observation is the rule and the effect, they grasp the thought that failure to recognize the cause destroys the result and learn to appreciate science as the basis of practical labor. The connection between the state of science and the productive forces of society is of manifold nature. This connection must be studied from a number of angles, for it is not as simple as may first appear. We shall therefore have to turn our attention in our consideration of science to its technique, its special organization of work, its content, its method, or alleged method, for all these components interact mutually and produce the level of the given science at a given time. Each of these elements will lead back directly or indirectly to the social technology. In the first place, the very existence of society is possible only after the productive forces have attained a certain level in their development. If the labor surplus is absent or limited and not increased, the growth of science is impossible. This desire for science could not be displayed before man had satisfied his other appetites. Certain very old observations are handed down to us from China, India, Egypt, but is, it is interesting to note that they were but imperfectly developed in those countries. The content of science is determined in the last analysis by the technical and economic phase of society. These are the practical roots, which explain why an identical scientific discovery, invention, or study may be achieved simultaneously in different places, perhaps quite independently. The ideas are said to be in the air, meaning that they grow out of the existing stage of life that has been produced by the level of the productive forces. <clears throat> in his Histoire, A. Bordeaux mentions the following discoveries resulting, as he puts it, from the presence of ideas in the air and from the conditions of life. The discovery of the relation between heat and mechanical work, induction, the induction coil, the gram ring, 
the infinitesimal calculus mentioned not only by Leibniz and Newton, but also by their predecessor Fermat, Cavalieri, etc., as far back as Archimedes. Bordeaux concludes, as for science, it shows how difficult it is to determine which person really made a certain discovery. <clears throat> Let us note that the practical object of a science by no means presupposes that each scientific principle directly influences practice. Assuming the theorem A to be important for practice and that this theorem cannot be proved except with the use of the theorems B, C, D, and that the three latter theorems are of no direct practical value, being, as we say, of purely theoretical interest, these theorems nevertheless are indirectly of practical significance as links in a single scientific chain. There are no useless or worthless scientific systems, just as there are no useless mechanical tools. While the problems have been put chiefly by technology and economy, their solution in many sciences depends on alterations in the scientific technique whose instruments are of extraordinary importance in widening the horizon. The microsco microscope, for example, was invented in the first half of the 17th century and of course had an immense influence on the evolution of science by favoring the development of botany, zoology, anatomy, and creating a new branch of science, bacteriology, etc. Equally obvious is the role of technique in astronomy, equipment of, obs of observatories, varieties of telescopes, devices for photographing stars, etc. In its turn, scientific technique depends on the material production in general, as a product of material labor. In scientific work, we usually find a corresponding organization of this work, also influencing the state of scientific knowledge. The division of scientific labor, specialization in science, the organization of great scientific units, e.g. laboratories, the establishment of scientific bodies and scientific intercourse are extremely important. All these phases, again, are ultimately determined by the economic and technical conditions. Thus, modern chemical lab laboratories grow with the industrial plants to which they are attached. Scientific intercourse becomes more frequent with the greater frequency of economic connections, etc. But technical and economic conditions also condition science in another respect. With the rapid expansion of technology, economic conditions and the entire standard of life are constantly changing, resulting not only in a swift growth of science, but in its acceptance of the concept of change as a guiding factor, use of the dynamic method. Conversely, where technology is conservative and of slow growth, the economic life will also advance, but slowly, and the human psychology infers that all things are permanent. Society then marks time and is governed by the principle of permanence. The class characteristics in the various branches of science also present themselves, reflecting either the mode of thought characteristic of the specific class or the interests of the class. Mode of thought, interests, etc. are in their turn determined by the economic structure of society. Let us give a few of these relations. <clears throat> in ancient times, technology, as we know, developed slowly, with resulting slow advance in technical knowledge. This neglect of technology has several causes. In the first place, antiquity was entirely aristocratic in its attitude. Even prominent artists, such as Phidias, are classed as artisans. They are incapable of bursting through the stone wall separating the aristocratic, aristocratic circle from the artisans and peasants. A second cause of the slight progress of technical discovery in antiquity is in its slave-holding system. We therefore find a lack of any impulse to develop the machine as a substitute for manual labor. Science was dead and the inter interest in technical problems, except for a few curiosities such as water clocks and water organs, had died out. <clears throat> Thence the character of the existing science. The natural sciences probably arose as a byproduct of artisan work, but since such work, as well as any manual work, was despised in ancient society, 
and as the slaves who observed nature were sharply distinguished from the masters who speculated and worked as amateurs at their leisure, often knowing nature only by hearsay, it is easy to explain much of the naive, vague, and mystical nature of ancient natural science. In the Middle Ages, we have a feeble and primitive technology with feudal relations in economic life. An entire system of superiors has been elaborated, culminating in the landlord and monarch. It should not surprise us to learn that the dominant thought was not very mobile. Resting all that was new, heresy was punished with burning and quartering, not occupying itself with the investigation of nature, but delving in theological problems. The important problems of the dis of discussion were the bodily size of Adam, whether he had brown or red hair, how many angels could stand on the point of a needle, etc. This immobile, conservative, theological, formal, scholastic character of the science of the time entirely opposed to er or experimental investigation may be explained by the conditions of the social life by the technical and economic relations, which ultimately rested on the stage of social evolution. The case became quite different when capitalist relations began to grow. We now are no longer dealing with a rigid technology, but, but with one that is rapidly changing, with new branches of production constantly growing up. We now need mechanics, engineers, chemists, and not theologians or knights. Where warfare also requires scientific knowledge, as well as mathematics. It is natural that this shift in the technical and economic relations are also necessarily resulted in a transformation of science. Scholasticism, Latin theology, etc. gave way to an experimental investigation of nature, to the natural sciences, to the realist school. We have here given an example of the general transformation in the content of science. We might, with close study, also trace this transformation in the methods of investigation, the tools of scientific thought, and in many other phases of science. An example of the influence of the class psychology and consequently also of the class structure of society is afforded by the organic theory in sociology already mentioned by us. Professor R.J. Whipper says the following on this subject. The comparison of society with an organism, the expression, the organic connection of the individual with society, as contrasted with the connection in a mechanical society, all these comparisons, formulas, and antitheses were launched by the reactionary publicists of the 19th century. In setting up this organ as opposed to a mechanism, these publicists were attempting to distinguish their demands sharply from the didactic and revolutionary principles of the previous century, the era of enlightenment. The state as a mechanism was the old terminology, equal rights for all men whose totality constitutes the sovereign people. The state is an organism was the new slogan arrangement of men in a traditional social hierarchy, subjection of the individual to a natural group, i.e. his subordination to the old social authority. Translated into concrete language, the organic relations mean serfdom, the guild system, subordination of workers to employers, defense of the honor and privileges of the nobility, etc. We give below a few additional data on the history of mathematics, since it is commonly assumed that mathematics, being a purely contemplative science, has nothing in common with practical life. We take them from the very important work of M. Cantor. Mathematical knowledge arose among the Babylonians, developing on the basis of surveying, measuring the cubic contents of vessels, commercial arithmetic, and the need of a precise division of time, the calendar, into years, days, hours, etc. The original mathematical instruments were the fingers, later calculating machines, a rope with little rods um, in geometry, later an instrument recalling the astro astrolabe. Mathematical study was closely connected with religion. 
the, num the numerals at first indicating the gods, their celestial precedents, etc. Mathematics attained a high state of development among the Egyptians. The ancient mathematical calculation book of Ames. Its, pre its precise title is Rules for Obtaining a Knowledge of All Obscure Things, of All Secrets Which Are Contained in Objects. Contains such headings as Rule for Calculating Around Greenery, Rule for Calculating Fields, Rule for Making an Adornment, etc. Arithmetical and occasionally algebraic operations are illustrated by means of problems clearly indicating the conditions of practice. This practice involves distribution of grain, distribution of rye, calculation of receipts, etc. The concluding statement of this mathematical primer clearly shows its connection with agriculture. We read, catch vermin, mice, gather fresh weeds, numerous spiders, beg the god Ra for warmth, wind, high water. The fingers were obviously the first calculating instruments, later a sort of board with knotted twine as in the case of the Peruvians. The basis of geometry was surveying. Besides problems in the measurement of fields, Ames also has problems for calculating the volume of granaries and the amount of grain they may hold. The Greek histor historian Diodorus writes of the Egyptians, the priests teach their sons two kinds of writing, the so-called sacred writing and a common writing. They diligently study geometry and arithmetic. For the river, the Nile, changes the country considerably each year thus producing much litigation concerning boundaries between neighbors. Such divisions cannot be adjusted without direct measurements made by a geometer. Arithmetic serves them in their household affairs. The astrono astronomical, geo geometrical, and algebraic rules were first connected with religious rites. They were sacred mysteries in which only a select few were initiated. The so-called Harp, harp denaps, rope weavers, or literally rope knotters, possessed the trade secret of setting the rope, of placing it at the proper angle with the meridian, etc. In fact, in general, the angles and sides of pyramids, the arrangement of their parts, had a certain sacred astro astronomical scientific meaning, which was probably imparted to the sons of the priests. Among the Romans, geometry advanced with the needs of landed property, which was so holy that even the gods possessed it. Mathematics attained its highest development, exceptional period according to Cantor. This exceptional condition of development was due to the presence of two practical problems. The construction of the calendar, the so-called Julian Cantor, calendar, Julius Caesar himself wrote a book on the stars, and the great survey of the Roman Empire. The latter problem was solved under Augustus, the great Greek engineer and mathematician, hero of Alexandria, being invited to conduct the work. For the first time, a complete map of the entire empire was compiled. We later find in um, Col Columella a consideration of mathematics in its relation with agriculture, in Sextius Julius Frontinus, a treatment of mathematics is applied to the calculation of aqueduct tubes, the important mathematical symbol P to represent the ratio between circumference and diameter of the circle. In the so-called Codex Arcerianus, a legal scientific reference work for administrative officials of the Roman Empire in the 6th and 7th centuries AD, we find a member or a number of articles on field surveying for purposes of taxation. The development of arithmetic was due chiefly to the demands of trade. Interest calculations, according to Horace, an accomplishment of daily use, calculations of inheritance bequests in accordance with the complicated Roman legislation, merchants calculations. They were the motives underlying the evolution of arithmetic. Among the ancient East Indians, we find astronomy, algebra, and the beginnings of trigonometry. The conditions in this country resemble those found among other ancient peoples. 
the mathematical chapters of a learned collected work give evidence in the designations and content of the problems of the living basis of Indian mathematics. A mathematical method, for instance, is suggested in the following verse. Multiplications become divisions. Divisions become multiplications. What was profit becomes loss. What was loss becomes profit. In another passage, we find the problem, a 16-year-old female slave cost 32 nishkas. How much will a 20-year-old slave girl cost? Interest calculations follow at the rate of 50% per month. Also problems for calculating all kinds of commercial transactions, etc. The unknown quantities designated by X, Y, X in present day algebra were called by the Indians coin. The positive quantities were assets. The negative quantities, liabilities. Architecture and its mathematical rules were here also enveloped in mystery, having a specific astronomic and divine significance. The measurement of fields, the construction of palaces and temples, the calculation of contents were the moving impulse in Indian geometry. Among the ancient Chinese, the evolution of mathematics proceeded along the same general lines, with the class character of science, its monopoly, more sharply expressed. There were three sets of numerals, one for state officials, one for science, one for civilian merchants. In a collection of laws, we find the following mathematical offices. The hereditary dignity of court astronomer and court astrologer, followed by the head geometer, to whom was entrusted the laying out of the walls and palaces of cities. Below him, a special official for the measuring apparatus, who performed measurements with an instrument called to QA, namely a shadow indicator, making the necessary calculations, etc. It is easy to conclude from the above, one, that the content of science is given by the content of technology and economy, two, that its development was determined, among other things, by the tools of scientific knowledge, three, that the various social conditions now encouraged, now retarded progress, Four, that the method of scientific thought was determined by the economic structure of society, the religious, divinely mysterious character of ancient mathematics, in which even a number sometimes designated a divinity, is a reflection of the feudal slaveholding order of society with its inaccessible ruler, its priestly officials, etc. Five, that the class structure of society impressed its class stamp on mathematics, in part merely on the mode of thought, in part on the form of material interest, excluding ordinary mortals from the sacred mysteries. In modern times, we find the same causal relations, but they are more complicated and, of course, different in form. The technology and the economic conditions have changed entirely. Religion and philosophy Religion and philosophy are the next forms of the superstructure to which we shall devote our attention. The thoughts and observations accumulated by human society give rise to the need of grouping and classifying them. Science has resulted from this need, but science began at a very early stage to be subdivided into various branches, and within these special sciences there proceeded an, ad an adaptation of thoughts to thoughts, i.e. systematization. But in addition, a need was felt for something that would hold together all these knowledges and errors that would realize an equilibrium between them. Religion and general science had to provide this uniting principle. It is that which had to furnish the answers to the most abstract and general questions as to the cause of all existence, the nature of the universe, whether the universe is as it seems or otherwise, the nature of mind and matter, the possibility of a knowledge of the universe, the nature of truth, the ultimate causes of all phenomena, the nature of truth, ultimate causes of all phenomena, the existence of limits to human knowledge, the defining of these limits, and a host of similar questions. Of course, our answer to these questions will influence our conception of any specific phenomenon. If, for instance, all depends on the will of God, who guides the world according to his divine plan, 
All our knowledge must be arranged in teleological or theological order, and at certain epochs science actually assumed this form. All phenomena then required us to seek the so-called hand of God, the divine purpose. But if the gods are not involved, if causal relation is the only element of importance, our attitude toward the phen phenomena of the universe becomes quite different. If philosophy and religion, therefore, are the spectacles through which all facts are viewed as at a certain stage in evolution, a study of the conditions underlying the construction of these spectacles is very important. As for religion, we already know that its essence is a faith in supernatural powers, in miraculous spirits. This faith may be in one or more such forces, may be crude or more intangible and ethereal. This notion of spirit, soul, etc. was a reflection of the particular economic structure of society at the time when the eldest of the clan and leader the patriarch arose in the patriarchate the case is essentially the same in the matriarchate. In other words, when the division of labor led to the segregation of administration, administrative work. The eldest of the clan, the guardian of its accumulated experience in production, administers, commands, outlines the plan of labor, represents the act of creative, princi creative principle, while the rest obey, execute commands, submit to the plan handed out by their superior, act in accordance with another's will. This mode of production became a pattern for the interpretation of all phases of existence, particularly man himself. Man was divided into body and spirit. The spirit guides the body and is as much superior to the body as the organizer and administrator is superior to the simple executant. In one passage, Aristotle compares the soul with the master and the body with the slave. All the rest of the world began to be considered in accordance with the same scheme of things. Behind each thing, man saw the spirit of this thing. All nature became animated with a spirit, a scientific conception which is known as animism, from the Latin anima, soul, or animus, spirit. This conception, once established, necessarily led to the origin of religion, beginning with the worship of ancestors, of the elders of the clan, of supervisors and organizers in general. Their spirits or souls were naturally considered to be the most intelligent, most experienced, most powerful spirit, spirits capable of giving aid and on whom all things depended. Here we already have a religion showing in its origin that it also is a reflection of production relations particularly those of master and servant, and the political order of society conditioned by them. The whole world was explained in accordance with the pattern used to explain life in society. In all its later history, religion shows alterations proceeding parallel with the alterations in the production relations and the social-political relations. In a society consisting of loosely connected clans, each with its own elders and princes, religion assumes the form of polytheism. Should a centralized monarchy arise, it will be found paralleled in heaven where a single god will mount the throne, as cruel as the ruler of the earth. The religion of a slave-holding commercial republic, for instance the Athens of the 5th century BC, will show the gods organized as a republic, even though the goddess of the victorious city Pallas Athena may be given unusual prominence. In parallel with the hierarchy of officials found in any respectable state, we also find a corresponding organization of saints, angels, gods, etc. in heaven arranged in accordance with their dignity, rank, and order. Furthermore, a division of labor is instituted among the gods as among mundane superiors. One is made a specialist for military affairs. Mars in the Roman mythology, St. George, or the Archangel Michael, the Ar Archistrategists in the Greek Catholic Church, another for commercial matters, Mercury, a third for agriculture, etc. The parallel even extends to amusing details. For instance, among the Russian saints, there are specialists like the Spetses in Soviet Russia for horse breeding. Froll and Lover, 
any relation of domination and subjection is paralleled by a religi religion reflecting this relation. As actual life presents cases of war, enslavement, and insurrection, so religion teaches that these also occur in the celestial field or spheres. Devils, demons, princes of darkness are merely heavenly, heavenly parallel to the hostile leaders seeking to destroy the state on earth. In heaven, they attempt to undermine the emperor, the almighty, and subvert the entire celestial order. This theory of the origin of religion, which we accept absolutely, belongs to A. Bog Bogdanov and was first formulated in the Russian handbook, Contributions to Social Psychology. Later, special investigations have entirely confirmed this conjecture, which is touched upon by H. Kanau in his book, um, Ur Ursprung der Religion in des Gottes Glaubens. <laughs> Kanau objects to the conception which would have religion emanate from the various observations of external nature and rightly declares, we may indeed, since each conceptual image is determined by the conception at its basis, its substratum, maintain in a certain sense that both the natural environment and the social life determine the religious ideology. But aside from the fact that the view of nature is in turn largely dependent on the degree to which man has succeeded in technically utilizing the forces of nature in the production of his material life. The natural conceptual image furnished only the external adornments. One might almost say only the local color for the religious system of thought. But Air Canal does not pursue this thought to its logical conclusion and fall, falls a victim to the most incredible childishness. Thus he states, all natural and semi-civilized races are naturally dualists. This recalls Adam Smith's designation, designation of exchange as an entirely natural property of man, or the explanation of the origin of science in man's innate tendency to causality. According to Canal, the fact that man has both soul and body is fortified by dream visions and the trance fainting condition. Something apparently leaves the body, later returning to it but only that which is can be fortified. Perhaps death is a phenomenon called forth, the notion of a soul separate from the body, but Canal himself gives us, gives us examples of savages who do not understand the necessity of natural death. In fact, many tribes, John Fraser reports this of the Australians in New South Wales, ascribe death itself to the mysterious ma malignance of an evil spirit. In other words, this explains nothing at all. We may mention in passing that M. N. Pokrovsky derives religion from the fear of death, from those departed, etc. But suppose even the conception that all men are mortal is lacking. It is obvious that Pokrovsky considers natural or primitive what is really a historical category, historical in its origin. In Canal's mind, religion evolves as follows. Beginnings of a spirit worship, then totem worship, totems are the birds, animals, plants that were once the coats of arms of the tribes, and ancestor worship. But in almost all of the examples mentioned by Canal, his most primitive spirits are the spirits of ancestors. In his chapter on the beginnings of spirit worship, Canal writes, only the spirits of close relations or at any rate of members of the same horde are regarded as well disposed and not always even these the spirits of the dead of strange hordes and tribes are all considered as hostile the name father is given to the spirit of either parent to that of grandfather and great-grandfather to any spirit at all etc canal gets nowhere by this method on page six, he accepts the formula that religious impressions are called forth by the impressions of social life. But on page 17, he has already ceased to speak of the social nature of the spirit, now speaking of its own nature, its own origin, 
growth and decay, particularly death. But Canal will surely not dare term birth and death as specifically social phenomena. In reality, what is true of external nature is also true of the biological nature of man. The impressions of all these phenomena, death, sleep, trance, as well as thunderstorms, earthquakes, will of the wisps, the sun, etc., furnish a partial material out of, the, out of which the total is built up from the point of view of dualism. A dualism by no means innate, but arising from the fundamental conditions of social life. We are giving so much attention to Canal because his book, on the whole, quite valuable, is almost the only Marxian work on the history of religion. Edward Meyer considers the fundamental cause for the origin of religion to lie in the direct presence of a causality instinct and in also directly given dualism. Man experiences within himself two parallel sets of phenomena in causal relation with each other. On the one hand, phenomena of consciousness, feeling, conceiving, volition. On the other hand, bodily movements, arbitrary actions resulting from the above. <clears throat> the dualism of body and soul is therefore a primitive experience and not the product of reflection of however primitive a nature. This marvelous theory, on the one hand, flies in the face of the facts, and on the other hand, explains nothing. It contents itself with a description of that which requires explanation. Professor Achilles comes closer to a correct understanding of the matter. <clears throat> he considers religious conceptions to be merely a mirror of social political conceptions and in institutions. Even death was able to arouse the attention of the savage only in society. All the differentiations in political power and standing shown by the various concrete forms of organization are here found faithfully reflected. The chieftains and kings among men are paralleled by the great gods among the lesser spirits. The imposing figure of a more or less generally recognized ruler predominates quite on the earth pattern on the earthly pattern in the motley crowd of different gods but achilles is excellent because it is marxian chapter on religion does not prevent him from shamefully distorting marx from never mentioning him by name and from taking off his hat to religion here we are obviously dealing with a contradiction between the evolution of science and the interests of the bourgeoisie we shall now furnish examples for the correctness of the Marxian standpoint. For the ancient Babylonians, two or three thousand years before Christ, heaven is a prototype of earth. Everything earthly is created in accordance with the heavenly pattern. An indissoluble bond exists between the two. The gods are the protectors, spirits of individuals. God, my God, are equivalent to our patron saints of streets, cities, regions, etc. The divinity is indissolubly connected with the destinies of its city. Its magnitude grew with the expansion of the city territory. If the inhabitants annexed other cities, the divinities of the subject peoples were subjected to the home divinity. On the contrary, the removal of a divine image from the city and the destruction of its temple were equivalent to the political destruction of the city. By the side of the great gods, there are also a number of smaller spirits, of celestial and terrestrial spirits. Parallel with the formation of the Babylonian monarchy precedes that of the celestial monarchy. The rise of Babylon carried in its wake certain changes in its pantheon. The god of Babylon had to take the place of honor. Such a god was Marduk, whose name was of Sumerian origin. He was the god of the sun in springtime. The dynasty of um, Hammur Hammurabi, a Babylonian king whose code of laws has been found in excavations on the site of ancient Babylon, elevated him into a supreme god. The following evolution took place in the case of the other great gods. Enlil, king of heaven and earth, handed Marduk the domination over the four lands of the world and his name as ruler of these lands. 
As for Ea, Marduk was proclaimed his firstborn son, to whom his father had graciously ceded his rights and his power, his role in the creation of the world. <clears throat> When the Babylonian monarchy had struck firm root, there gradually arose the conception of unified power, manifesting itself in countless visible forms, and accordingly bearing countless different names. The priests began to maintain that the other great gods were merely manifestations of Marduk. Ninib is Marduk of strength, Nergal is Marduk of battle, Enlil is Marduk of might and domination. Here is a fragment of a hymn of prayer to the god Sin, excellently characterizing the monarchic construction of the celestial power. Lord, ruler of the gods, sole great lord in heaven and on earth, thou who has created the earth, founded the temples, and given them names, father, begetter of gods and men, mighty leader, whose mysterious depth has been sounded by no god. Father, creator of all beings, ruler, thou who desirest the the destinies of heaven and earth, whose bidding is inexorable, who providest warmth and cold, who rulest living things, what God is like unto thee, who is great in heaven, thou alone, and on earth who is great, when thy word resounds in the heavens, the he fall into the dust, when it resounds on earth, the Anunnaki kiss the dust, ruler, in thy rule on heaven and earth, none is like unto thee among the gods, thy brethren, etc. Sin is here depicted almost as a celestial emperor, before whom all appropriate ceremonies are carried out, bending the knee, kissing the ground, etc. It is self-evident that the official religion always has expressed chiefly the idea of the ruling class, as we may note even in little things. For instance, in the feudal period, when warlike virtues were esteemed highest, and the ruling class, representing particularly the warlike great, the warlike great landlords, only those feel at home in the hereafter who have fallen in battle, while those for whose gifts in the hereafter no one can have much concern, namely the poor, fare but poorly. Max Weber furnishes us with a mass of valuable material concerning the religion of the ancient East Indians and his interesting investigations on the economic morality Here, of the world religions. The economic and vocational stratification of society into classes directly assumes the form of castes, later confirmed by religion. According to the old legal code of Manu, the four chief castes are the Brahmins, priests, scholars, noble literati, um, Kshatriyas, noble knights and warriors, uh, Vaisyas, farmers, later also usurers and merchants, and Sudras, slaves, artisans, etc. A caste is thus always essentially a purely social, eventually a vocational subdivision of the social community. The Brahmins and Kshatriyas control everything and everybody. The Vaisyas are considered only as a pure caste, worthy of handing food or water to the Brahmins. The Sudras are divided into pure and impure. A noble will accept, a noble will accept no water from the latter. No barber may cut the nails of their feet, etc. Below the impure Sudras, there are also other impure castes. Some may not enter any temples. Others are so impure that even to touch them is defiling. In some cases, approaching within 60 feet of such a person is an impurity for a noble or other pure person. Food is rendered impure by the mere glance of the impure, etc. Even the excrement of a Brahmin may have religious significance. Thousands of rulers and religious ceremonies support the existing order. Kings and rulers are descended from the Kshatriyas. The aristocratic nature of the state extends also to the economic life. Price fixing, taxes in kind, national storehouses, with a monstrous bureaucratic mechanism. Max Weber considers the following as the two fundamental religious ideas growing out of this soil. The idea of transmigration and the doctrine of reward and punishment. All acts of men are recorded. Each has his account, his good and evil actions being balanced. 
After death, he will be reincarnated in the form to which the balance sheet of his actions at the moment of his death entitles him. He may come to life again as a king, as a Brahmin. He may be transformed into a worm in the entrails of a dog. The basis of the most important virtues is the observance of the caste order. The slaves, the impure, most know their place. He who is unfailing, who never forgets his impurity, may perhaps in the life after death become a noble, but on earth the caste system is not to be tampered with. Accidents of birth do not exist. The individual is born into the caste to which his is his by reason of his conduct in an earlier life. This doctrine exp expresses most distinctly the social order and the interests of the ruling classes, but we find this reflection even earlier. For instance, the gods of the Vedas, ancient sacred hymns, are functional and heroic gods of a type externally similar to those in Homer, and the heroes of the Vedic period are warlike kings dwelling in mountain fatness, fastnesses, fat, fastnesses and fighting in chariots, having retinues and with a predominantly cattle breeding peasantry. The characteristic gods are Indra, god of thunderstorms, and therefore, like Yahweh, a warlike and heroic god of impetuous character, and Varuna, the wise, all-seeing, functional god of the eternal order, particularly the legal order. It should be remembered that the heavens were originally destined only for the Brahmas and Kshatriyas, along, alongside of the official religion of the ruling classes, there was also a religion of the people, often including, among other things, sexual manipulations. The Vedas designate one of these cults as an evil custom of the subjected ones. We are therefore dealing with class religions. For instance, here is the description of the religious split in southern India, reminding one somewhat of the schism in the Russian church. A portion of the lower castes and the royal artisans coming from other parts their opposed re reglementation by the Brahmins, and thus arose the still existing schism of the Valange and the Idinge, the castes to the right and to the left. Among the ancient Greeks, the feudal order and later the slave order were reflected in heaven, Zeus being the chief of all the gods, Demeter the goddess of agriculture, Hermes the god of trade and intercourse, Helos the god of the liberal professions arts. The class struggle proceeded along these lines. In Athens in the 5th century, period of highest culture and incipient decay, religion was one of the chief weapons of the ruling class of the commercial democracy. In the opinion of Sophocles, one of the orthodox poets of the time, the entire world will perish if faith ceases, for all the moral and state regulations, according to Sophocles, depend on the will of the gods. The opposition element of the nobility and the declassed strata, strata make use of a criticism of religion in order to criticize the existing order. The merchant democracy imposes the death penalty for expressions of doubt as to the existence of the gods. The ancient Slavs present the same picture. Ancestor worship, worship of the tribal gods, of house gods, of vocational gods are found here also. The most important national god was that of the traders and noble warriors, simultaneously also god of thunder, Param, or god of thunder, Param. Paradise was reserved for departed princes and their retinue. There was no place for ordinary mortals. Let us now consider the modern forms of the Christian religion. The Russian Orthodox Church was a precise reflection of Byzantine Muscovite absolutism. God is the Emperor, the Mother of God, the Empress. St. Saint, Saint Nicholas, the Wanderer, Worker, and the other popular saints are his ministers of state. Under them is an entire nation of officials, angels, archangels, cherubim, seraphim, etc. 
Due division of labor exists between these heavenly courtiers. St. Michael is commander-in-chief. The mother of God is first lady of the court. St. Nicholas is principally the god of fruitfulness of the soil. St. Pantalamon Pantalamon is a sort of medicine man. The victorious St. George is the divine warrior, etc. The more distinguished saints have finer honors, better halos, fairer raiment, sacrifices, etc. The class struggle repeatedly assumed religious forms in Russia. Schisms, the sects of the Stundists, the Flagellants, Molokans, etc. We cannot pursue this subject here, but merely point out that the Russian designations for divinity distinctly indicate the true origins of these precise notions of godhood. Lord is practically the same as Gospodin, master. God has the same root as Bogody, rich. Ruler, heavenly father, judge, father, etc. Such are the names of the feudal noble monarch who looks upon the people as his slaves. Absolutism has had good reason to be content with the Orthodox Church. Religion as a superstructure consists not only of a system of ideas that have been fitted into a pattern, but like science, it also has a corresponding personal organization, a ecclesiastical organization, and a system of, spe of special methods and rules in the worship of God. The services, liturgy, high mass, low mass, with many ceremonials, conjurations, magic formulas, and a great number of unintelligible magic incantations, the God's cult. This phase of the religious superstructure is also indissolubly, indissolubly bound up with the course of social life. The church has at every epoch reproduced and repeated contemporary society within itself and its economic and cultural traits. In the period of the feudal magnates, the church was a feudal magnate, while democratic elements and the forms of financial economy were expressed by the church in the period of the rise of the cities, etc. The original form of the professional clergyman was the sorcerer, mountbank, clairvoyant, prophet, soothsayer, etc., whom Edward Meyer considers as the earliest social classes known to us. In general, the highest class of priests were a portion of the ruling class, reflecting its division of labor, some of the rulers becoming military leaders, other priests, other legislators, etc. It does not surprise us to find the church reproducing and repeating contemporary society. The dominant church also constitutes an economic organization whose economic conditions are a portion of the general economic conditions of society as a whole. Thus we learn from the legal code of laws of Hammurabi, king of Babylonia, that the temple of the god Shamash executed many transactions and usually collected 20% interest, the rate rising to 33% and even to 40% in the case of loans on grain. In the Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church was a veritable feudal kingdom with a tremendous economic system, imposts and taxes, the so-called tithes, an administrative mechanism. Similarly, the monasteries and lavras, groups of monasteries in Russia, accumulated immense wealth. Characteristically enough, the magnificent edifice of the Moscow Stock Exchange belonged to the Troitsa Sergius Lavra. The church, in addition to serving as a pac pacifier of the masses, restraining them from violations of the established order of things, itself was and still is a portion of the exploiting machinery constructed according to the same general plan as the larger exploiting society. Society, except in its initial stage, was, almost was always class society. Its production relations were those of domination and submission. Its political system was a reflection and an expression of this condition. Its religion justified this condition and secured its acceptance by the masses, sometimes by very skillful means, as in the case of the Hindu doctrine of reincarnation and compensation discussed above. But this conciliation did not always last. The oppressed classes, unable to free themselves entirely from the religious mode of thought, would set up their own religion in opposition to the orthodox religion. 
so-called heresies arose in opposition to the Orthodox Church doctrine. We now have an official church and also special religious groups of dissenters, sometimes organized illegally and cons conspir conspiratively with priests and prophets of their own, who are also their political leaders. A short time ago, such a view of religion and the church would have been considered as downright blasphemy. Even bourgeois investigators who have made a special study of the subject now accept this view. One of the best modern students of religion, Max Weber, arrives at the following conclusion with regard to Asiatic religions. On the whole, we observe everywhere the same group of cults, schools, sects, orders of all kinds, which is also characteristic of Occidental antiquity. Of course, the competing tendencies were not looked upon with equal favor by the temporary majority in the ruling classes or by the political powers. There were orthodox and heterodox persons, the former including a number of more or less legitimate schools, orders, and sects. Particularly important for us is the observation that they were distinguished from each other socially. In the first place, according to the strata of society in which they existed, in the second place, however, according to the species of salvation ministered to the various strata of their adherents. We find the former case where, for instance, an upper social class that rigidly condemns the entire religion of redemption is opposed by popular soteriolo soteriologists among the masses, as was typical of China. We, but we may also find the various social strata following different forms of soteriology. Soteriology. 